Sometimes dealing with the root of an issue is so hard, we would rather just kind of, kind of try to manage it on the outside edges instead of getting to the, the real core of the problem. Uh, many of you know that uh, every summer, well, most summers anyway, uh, my family heads up uh, for a vacation in New Hampshire uh, at a little house on a lake that Cheryl's family has passed down through the generations. Uh, and this year, because of some construction uh, up, up the hill from where the house is, and because of uh, more than the usual amount of rain, uh, it's been a really tough season for them there uh, because they keep having to go to the camp to bail out water from the basement. Uh, it keeps on flooding, and, and as this happened once and then twice, they realized there was more rain than usual. They realized there's more water coming down from up the hill than usual, but it shouldn't be this bad. And they realized there is a drain pipe that runs underneath uh, this, this little lake house, and it doesn't have a cement floor. It has one of those kind of rock permeable, uh, loose rock floors, uh, and this drain pipe is designed in you know, all circumstances to kind of pull out that water. And even if there is a flooding type situation, it will at least help pull out that water. Well, that wasn't happening anymore. And they looked at the job and realized if they were going to fix it, it was going to be thousands of dollars to unclog this drain pipe. Or if they do the work themselves, and these are not wimpy people, these are hardworking. He's worked outdoors his entire life. Uh, it was going to be the hardest job they'd ever done. So what do you think you would do in that situation? I tell you what I would do, and it's what they did. They started bailing out water. And then it would rain again, and they'd head over there, and they'd get the sump pump out, and they'd bail out water. And then it would rain again, and they'd go over there, uh, and they'd start bailing out water again until they realized that was not going to solve the issue unless they got that drain pipe uh, uh, un, you know, fixed. They would be bailing out water for the rest of their lives. And so uh, I bring that up this morning because sometimes, because the job seems so difficult, we are hesitant or unwilling to go really at the core of our issue. There might be a relationship issue, a parenting issue, a marriage issue. And we could kind of maybe try to have a good day or a good week or a good month. But are we really asking the question, what is at the source of whatever is going wrong here? We might be having some financial issues. Uh, the kinds of things where we're, we, well, we didn't spend our money well this month, but this, uh, last month, but this month we're going to get it right and kind of keep month to month trying to like catch ourselves to be better with our money and then find out, oh no, we're in trouble again because we haven't gotten to the core of the issue. Or maybe it's our relationship with God. We hear about people who seem so close to God and they say, how come I can't experience that myself? Like this month, I'm going to try harder. I'm really going to get in my Bible. And the month goes by and by the end of it, we're off track again. And the reason for that is, is that we all have a core issue that, that is the cause of many of these problems. And it is our sin and our sinfulness. Now, I'm not talking about every problem. I'm not talking about some illnesses, things that you don't have control over. I'm talking about the kind of things that we do have a say in, that we do have control over. Uh, but sometimes kind of confronting our sin, con confronting the core of our issue is kind of scary or difficult. And so we don't want to do it. So we think we could just manage it, but the situation never changes. Well, thankfully, we have a God who does change lives and does change hearts. And today we want to talk about how we could uh, genuinely, or I, let's put it this way, that we could experience genuine deliverance from some of these kinds of issues. Genuine deliverance. I'm going to use that phrase a lot. Genuine deliverance. Not just deliverance for a day or a week or a month. Not just bailing out water and look, it's dry for another how long until it rains again. But genuine deliverance from some of those issues because many of those issues are sourced in our hearts and because of our Sin. We're going to see that in Judges chapter 10 uh, and 11 this morning. So you could open up there, Judges chapter 10. Uh, we're going to, this is going to do a little bit more than half of the Jephthah story, one of the judges in the book of Judges. Uh, judge, if you haven't been following along with us, is not someone who bangs a gavel, uh, gavel and wears a robe, but is a leader uh, who God uses to deliver his people. Uh, and as we walk through Jephthah's story, we're going to see a couple things. We're going to see uh, how God sometimes deals with our sin issue, uh, how our issue, our, or we're going to explore more our issue of kind of uh, avoiding dealing directly with our sin rather than kind of working along the outside edges, and how we might experience God's genuine deliverance. 
So I'm going to start reading in chapter 10. Uh, the first uh, four, uh, uh, first uh, five verses of chapter 10 talk about two judges very quickly, Tola and Jair. It doesn't say a lot about them. We don't get a lot of details. It's there for historical reasons. Although I wish we had more on Jair, who judged Israel for 22 years and had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities. I wish we had more, but we don't. And so uh, we, we do find, though, that we are going to uh, head into the next cycle of the book of Judges in verse 6. And it says this, The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. And I think we need to bring back the word forsook in our everyday uh, vocabulary. That is a powerful word. But we see that Israel has made the same mistake it's made throughout the book of Judges. If you haven't been following along with us, there's this cycle that continues in the book of Judges. It seems to get worse every time. The Israelites disobey God by trusting in idols or becoming more like the culture around them. Uh, then there is disaster because of that. Uh, they cry out to God for help, and he sends a deliverer for them. But I got to say that this obedience to turning to idols is worse this case in, than in the previous cycles. Uh, in the past, we've heard about them turning to the Baal these false idols or false gods. Or we've heard to them turn to Ashtar, to the Ashtaroth poles and other things. But now it's all the gods of all the surrounding peoples. If you have five Israelites in a room, they are worshiping seven gods. Like that's the picture that's being drawn here. And because the situation seems worse than ever, we get a different response from God. Let's keep on reading in verse 7. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed and oppressed the people of Israel that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight, against, uh, fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that the Israel was severely distressed. And this is the disaster that befalls them. And so then they cry out to God, verse 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Moanites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And he became impatient over the misery of Israel. Israel. And so things are different. We would expect that after the Israelites cry out to God for help, that he would then kind of come in and, and raise up a judge and by God's power use that judge to deliver his people. But God says, no, no, no. I keep on delivering you and you keep on falling into the sin. I keep on saving you. And then by the next generation, you've turned away to me to all these other false gods who have no power. And God is very sarcastic in this. He says, go ahead and let these other gods save you then. Right? Knowing that these gods have no power to do anything for the Israelites. They are false gods. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And this kind of explains why there's always disaster when the Israelites disobey. It's kind of a commentary, really, on the whole book of Judges. This is why every time they turn away from God, it says sometimes even God sends these, these hostile peoples to oppress the Israelites. Because he's saying, okay, if you want to go and follow other gods, I'm going to treat you like people who follow other gods. And that brings us to our first point. That sometimes God gives us what we want. Sometimes God gives us what we want and is not a blessing. Sometimes it is a discipline. Sometimes God gives us what we want, not as a blessing, but as a discipline. That is what he is doing with the Israelites here. He's saying, fine, if you want to follow those other gods... See where that leads you. See how that ends up for you. This is not unusual thing for God to do. He has done this several times. Uh, well, he's doing it actually throughout all of the Bible. Uh, at the beginning in Genesis, 
uh, when the man and the woman eat of the, no- of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, when Adam and Eve eat uh, of the fruit that God commanded them not to, uh, he, he says, fine, if you want to live without me, leave the garden. I mean, that's what they're asking for. They're asking to be their own gods. And God says, okay, leave the garden, but see how that will lead you into disaster. It says similar things in Romans chapter 1, in verse 24 through 28. It says that three times God turned them over to their sin. God turned them over to their sin. God turned them over to this sin. God turned them over to that sin. You're like, what is God doing here? This seems really cruel. But, but God has a, 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 a... Love is motivating giving us what we want in these cases. Because God's desire is that by us experiencing some of the consequences of living in this other way will eventually lead us back to God. This is like parents, when parents uh, kind of introduce natural consequences when they're trying to teach their children something. Maybe, you, uh, maybe a child says to their parents that day, I want to wear shorts. It's, it's shorts day. I'm tired of wearing pants. It's been a long winter. It's time for shorts. You're like, listen, it's freezing today. It's not warm like it was last week. It's, gonna be, it's literally going to be like 33 degrees. You can't wear shorts today. And they say, we want to wear shorts. And you're like, okay, fine. You wear shorts today. Now let's see how it goes. And as long as you're not a parent that's causing frostbite on your child, uh, that child will typically learn their lesson and say, oh, I will wear pants next time it's cold. That's essentially what God is doing. By kind of giving us what we want, sometimes, uh, even if it is not the right thing, we experience the problem of turning away from God, the problem of doing it our our own way, the consequences of that, and then turn back to him. And we're like, oh, that leads nowhere, right? If we say, I want to make money my God. I mean, we don't say that explicitly. But if our lives are oriented around seeking kind of financial stability— we will find that is a road that never ends because there's always a bigger house, a nicer car, more guitars, whatever your thing is, and it never satisfies. And hopefully at some point we say, oh, money is a bad God. Only the Lord, creator of the universe, can satisfy me. Or sometimes we make other people's opinions of us our God. I want to make everyone happy. I want my social media to blow up. I want that positive feedback always. But we find out that is is something that will never satisfy because you could never do enough to make everyone happy. You can't, no matter how hard you try. And if you try to live your whole life doing that for recognition or just the people around you only focused on just trying to keep everyone happy, we'll find that won't result in that satisfaction that only the Lord can bring. And so sometimes God says, yes, I'm going to give you what you want, even though you know it's not the right thing, and I know it's not the right thing, so that God might draw us back to him. And we get some indications that it does make an impact on the Israelites here. What was their response? Their response was, Lord, we have sinned, which is interesting. You're like, why? Well, of course they would say that in the Bible. That makes perfect sense. But so far in the book of Judges, every time that the Israelites turn away and then ask God for help, they've never made a confession like this before. This is unique. They say, Lord, we have sinned against you. And then at the end, they say it again after God says, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're going to see what it's like to follow these other gods. They say, Lord, we have sinned against you. And then they change, right? They actually, it says they turn away from their idols, So have the Israelites really made a turn here? Have they really made that turn towards God that we are hoping will finally break the cycle for them? Let's keep on reading. It says in verse 17, Then the Ammonites were called to arms, and they encamped in Gilead. And the people of Israel came together, and they encamped at Mitzpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, Who is the man who will begin to fight against the Ammonites? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now Jephthah was the Gileadite, was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead was the father of Je- uh, Jephthah. And Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. And then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah, and went out with him. And after a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. 
And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we might fight against the Ammonites. And then Jephthah, and they kind of go through nego- negotiation, and Jephthah says to them, like, listen, I, I was kicked out of my family's house. Are you really inviting me back to be leader of the Ammonites? Are you, or not the Ammonites, sorry, the Gileadites? There's a lot of ites here, okay? Uh, Ammonites are the, the, n- not the people of God. Uh, are you really going to put me over there? And they kind of go through this negotiation, and he says, yes, if you deliver Israel, we will put you in charge of everyone. Um, but this actually kind of leads us to our next point, because a number of things happened here. That God desires genuine, genuine repentance, not just requests for deliverance. That God desires genuine repentance, not just requests for deliverance. Because look at what happens in the story. They said, Lord, we're going to turn away from our idols, but what is it that they do next? They say, all right, God has saved us. Or, okay, we're going to turn away from those idols. God save us. But that's not what they say. Instead, they say, who is the man who will deliver us from our troubles? See, uh, it's really about this word repentance. Do you, that's kind of a churchy word. If you grew up in the, depending on what your background is, is your relationship with the word repentance. Some people, it's like, yes, this is a good thing. I'm constantly repenting. Other people grew up in a culture where it was like, repent sinners. And they have this like, ugh, kind of feeling when they hear the word repent. This is what repent means. It means to turn away from your sin and towards God. It means to turn away from your sin and towards God. And while that is certainly one motion, there's kind of two pieces of that. You have to both turn away from your sin and then towards God. But what the Israelites are doing is they're turning away from their idols. And what man will save us now? And what is the man they go to? Is it, is it a man who, who, uh, who is following God of, of, of good character? Uh, no. And just as a problem, not, not because of his background. God uses people with all sorts of uh, unusual backgrounds. That's what we've seen throughout the book of Judges. But he surrounds himself with worthless fellows. That may sound uh, like an antiquated terminology to us today, but that is a strong pronouncement against the people that Jephthah has surrounded himself with. My friend B.J. Walbert uh, described uh, Jephthah as the leader of a biker gang. Right? That's what you want to imagine in your mind. A big, bad dude. And not the kind of biker gang that does toys for tots and rides for veterans. Biker gang that's like bar fights and selling meth so they don't have to get a real job. All right? That's the kind of worthless fellows that Jephthah is, is, is running with. And so we have these people, they turn away from the idols and then go, who's the man that will save us? Biker gang leader. Do you think that is going to go well for Israel? Probably not. And what we see is a problem of not genuine repentance. Not really saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to turn away from my sin. And I'm going to trust in you to deliver me. But, Lord, I'm going to turn away from sin. And now we're going we're to get to work solving this issue on our own. Right? And we're all tempted to do this. Right? It's like we were talking about at the very beginning. Uh, this, this, this idea of, of we're, we're continually bailing out water instead of really settling in with the core issue is that, Lord, we are sinners. And we need your help, Lord, to do this. Lord, we don't need just a behavior change. We don't just need a change of circumstances. Lord, we need a heart change. Lord, I'm only going to repair this relationship with my brother and sister in Christ or this family member or whoever it is if you change my heart, Lord, and theirs probably. Right? Not just, Lord, change my circumstances. Lord, I'm only going to really establish a firm relationship with you, be, with you if you help me, God. Because I know on my own, I could create up all the systems and five-step plans I want. But at the end of the day, if it's up to me, I know I'm going to fall off my Bible reading plan at the end of the month. So I need to trust in you, Lord, to help me and in, in your supernatural power to work in me, to change my life, to get to the core of the issue. Well, Jephthah is a nuanced character. Um, many times we want very simple good guys and bad guys, right? And I already called him kind of a, a, the leader of a biker gang. But Jephthah does know the Lord, or at least know enough about him. And, and he is a man who shows a tremendous amount of faith in, throughout the next sections. 
Uh, in the next section, he reaches out to the Ammonites and basically says, Ammonites, you have no claim to this land. You have no right to invade us and bring your army here. Uh, Ammonites, this wasn't even your land to begin with. Like, we, it was another people's land. You don't even have, you have no claim on it whatsoever. Uh, and after winning a, a, winning a victory in battle, uh, like an initial victory to kind of march his army into the area where they could even confront the Ammonites, uh, Jephthah says, all right, I've warned you. I've given you this history of, of, of Israel. This is, this is the history of us coming into this land. You have no claim to this. Let the Lord be the judge. It literally says that in verse 27. I, therefore, have not sinned against you, and you do me wrong by making war on me. The Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. But the king of the Ammonites did not listen to the words of Jephthah that he sent to him. And then it says in verse 29, Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and passed on to Mitzpah of Gilead. And from Mitzpah of Gilead he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering." So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. And he struck them from Eroer to the neighborhood of Mintha, uh, 20 cities, and as far as Abel Karamim, with a great blow, so the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. And so God's Spirit enables Jephthah to do this. He shows great faith in the Lord to deliver them. Almost. Because in a moment of rashness, he made a vow before the Lord. He said, Lord, whatever comes out of this house, I'm going to sacrifice to you. I don't know what Jephthah was thinking exactly. I don't know what he thought might come out of that house. But it does explain what happens next in verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mitzpah, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. And as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes. That'd be like a sign of grieving in the ancient world. He tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me. For I have opened my mouth to the Lord, and I cannot take back my vow. And she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do to me according to what was, uh, has gone out of your mouth, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites." And she goes and she says, give me two months. I'm going to grieve the fact that I was never married, that I was never able to have uh, children. Uh, and it ends by saying, and the daughters of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in the year. And Jephthah, because of this promise he made to God, ends up sacrificing his daughter. This is an ugly story. And Christians sometimes throughout the decades have struggled to wrestle with what, what to do with this. Um, some have trouble speaking poorly against Jephthah because he's named as a great man of faith. Uh, he is. Uh, but he obviously made, made a terrible, terrible decision. And if you look at the scriptures, uh, there's, a couple, there's a couple ways we see that, that, that we do not need to defend Jephthah in any way. This is wrong and not what the Lord desires. Uh, we know all the passages that talk about be careful of making a rash, uh, a rash promise or a rash vow, like Proverbs chapter 20. Uh, Numbers chapter 30 kind of warns, uh, like, if you make a vow, you're going to have to keep it. And the New Testament, Jesus teaches about uh, these kind of vows in Matthew chapter 5. He says, maybe just don't make vows, right? Let your yes be yes and no be no. Don't be going and making these kinds of rash vows before the Lord. Just simply do what you say you are going to do. But what Jephthah did was completely against the character of God. That even though he had trusted him in battle in that kind of moment of rashness made, made that vow, uh, he didn't have to sacrifice his daughter. Like, there's provisions for animal sacrifice in the Old Testament law. That's why God put them there. In fact, uh, in Deuteronomy, God specifically prohibits this kind of activity among his people because all the surrounding peoples did this kind of thing. It says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have, gone, they have done for their gods. 
for they even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. And so, so the Mosaic laws completely prohibits what Jephthah did because that is what the people who worship idols do. And when I've talked about the surrounding peoples having evil practices, that's, that's, that's not because, uh, you know, I, I have some, uh, you know, unusual standard of purity. They were truly evil cultures that would practice things like child sacrifice. Here's what happened with Jephthah. Even though he was pursuing God, even though maybe like the rest of the Israelites there, he had turned away from his sin, rather than looking for God in his ways, he kind of reverted to the ways of the surrounding culture and treated God not as, he, as God had presented himself to Israel and treated God not as, not as it had been passed down from, from generation to generation, but instead treated God like one of these idols that demanded these kinds of sacrifices. And so that's the end of our passage here, and it kind of ends with a warning for all of us to be careful of treating God in the way our surrounding culture does. To be careful that even in our desire to turn away from our sin and towards God, we do not start treating God like the rest of our culture might have us treat God. Right? We, don't, we don't necessarily try to control everything around us. We understand that things are ultimately in God's hands. There is no reason for Jephthah to make this vow. The Lord was going to deliver him. In fact, he'd already trusted God through, through a number of battles— to, to, to get to that final battle. All you have today is say, yes, God, deliver us. Deliver us from our trouble. And too many times we try to kind of manipulate or, or control. Here's why Jephthah's situation is kind of clearly uh, false as it's laid out in, in the chapter. Uh, remember earlier as he was talking to Ammonites, he said, let God be the judge over us. By making the vow, it's like, judge, whatever you would decide, you may do. And by the way, here's a little bribe under the table. Like, that's the modern equivalent. And so we want to be very careful of, of, of the, way, what, what we, what we, the, choose, the way we choose to, to worship and follow our God, not take on our cultural practices of the surrounding cultures. Things like, things like saying that, listen, God wants to give you everything you want. You just ask for it, he'll give you everything you want. We already addressed that one today. God does not always give us what we want for our own good. God does not always want us healthy and wealthy if it will result in a spiritual decline or a spiritual downfall, right? That is what our outside culture might tell us, but it's not the reality of the situation. Or, or, or there's also very much a surrounding culture that is not maybe hostile to Christianity, but says, hey, you go do that on Sunday, but then the rest of the week you kind of live however, right? You show up on Sunday, you pray, you do your thing, but then the rest of the week, it's kind of like God doesn't really exist until you're in trouble and kind of need help. And that's not what the Bible calls us to uh, at all. That's not the kind of the, the character that God calls us to or the holiness he calls us to at all. But that is kind of the, the temptation. And there's, and there's probably many other things you could think of uh, that our culture would practice, but that we don't want to assign that to God. And so that then leaves us in this place of like, okay, I get it. Like sometimes God gives us what we want, not as a blessing, but as, as a discipline to kind of show us to turn back to him. That he's looking for genuine repentance for us so that we might turn away from our sin and then to him, not just ask for changes to our circumstances. Uh, then the question is like, how do we actually trust him to do this? And so if we genuinely repent, that is when we might experience genuine deliverance. We need to turn away from our sin and genuinely repent to your king so you can experience genuine deliverance. Instead of closing with a story today, I want us to act this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to close in prayer together. And, and so we might kind of together go through that problem of, or not problem, sorry, that we go through that process of acknowledging our sin before the Lord. Turning away from it. And then turning towards God. Not asking for God to, to help us kind of bail out the water, but to get to the very core of our issue, our distance from him, and the reasons why we, we cause problems in our own lives so many times. And I'll invite you as, you, as, you, uh, as we close our eyes in just a moment to, to fill in the blanks with your own life. What are the things you need to turn away from? And how can you turn from God for help? to experience true deliverance, a true change of heart. Because here's the deal, 
God desires to help us. He wants to help us. His desire is not to let us run off all on our own forever. His, 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 his sometimes giving us what we want or letting us pursue this sin is not a final judgment. In fact, he desired to save us so much that he sent his own son to die in our place, to sacrifice himself. And that is not just something that helps us for the future. That is the same for the way we live our lives today. God desires for us to turn to him. He desires to help us, and he will help us when we ask. So let's ask. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning acknowledging our sin. Acknowledging, Lord, that we are not only imperfect, but there are times when we turn away from you. And whether it be uh, our politics or money or selfishness or, or prestige, Lord, there are so many other things that we might turn to as a God, knowing that you are only the only true God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all those other things fall short. In congregation, you might silently confess your sin to God right now. Heavenly Father, we, we reject those things that would turn us away from you. Help us turn away from them because you are the only true deliverer. You are the only one who could change our hearts, change our minds, mold and shape us into the people who you desire us to be. And so, Lord, we ask for your help to transform our hearts so that we might not just turn away from our sins, but that we would trust in you, Holy Lord, to work in us. In congregation, you might take a moment to silently ask God for help in your situation. Lord, you are good and just and pure and holy and righteous and all-powerful. And Lord, we, we pray that you would use some of your supernatural power to help make our repentance true, to make it genuine, that our hearts might be changed away from the sins that would pull us away from you, that we would trust in you fully, that we would know your goodness and pursue it even in our perfection, because we know we have the forgiveness of our sins. We know you are faithful to help us because of what you have done through Jesus Christ. We pray all this by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.